Good day, everybody. It's lunchtime in Europe, evening in Asia, and early morning in the Americas. Wherever you are dialing in from today, I welcome you and I uh, uh, to this Garrett Motion webinar. My name is Peter Davis, and it's my honor and privilege to spend the next hour with you on the subject of e turbochargers. What we want to do is in, give you some insights into uh, a new and exciting technology, uh, which is coming to uh, the roads near you uh, very soon. I will speak for about 40 minutes, and then there'll be a 20 minute question and answer session. You're invited to place your questions in the chat box beside uh, your, the, uh, the screen. And some of my colleagues will do the moderation of the questions uh, once we're uh, underway in that portion of it. So if you just uh, bear with me for a few moments while I uh, switch over to presentation mode, and I'll get the uh, presentation directly on the screen. So, all being well, you should be able to see the uh, cover page of the presentation. As I said, um, my name is uh, Peter Davis, and I'm Senior Director of Powertrain at uh, Garrett Motion. It's my privilege today to speak to you about this subject, Electric Turbo, a story from race to road. As you see on the screen, uh, we have a Formula One car in, uh, on the cover page. We're going over the next 40 minutes to take you through a four-step process of how we've come from Formula One to the actual public roads. We'll go through some of the uh, eTurbo's functionalities and what, uh, what this device can do for you. Uh, we'll go through a detailed case study on an SUV vehicle that we've prepared. Uh, we'll then go on to a new release, uh, something that was released only two or three weeks ago uh, at the Dresden Turbocharger Conference uh, in Germany. And we have now an exciting new small electric turbocharger in a C-segment vehicle. After the two case studies, we'll talk about some further potential that we're still working on. And then I'll conclude uh, what we've learned so far and what you may expect in the near future. Then we'll go into the question and answer session. And uh, all being well, we'll finish on time uh, in, a, in approximately one hour. So as I said, there are, we've been through a four-step process. Step one has been motorsport. Uh, since I think 2016, 2015, 16, we've been engaged in Formula One, and indeed the sport has become so much more exciting as a result of the installation of MGUH and MGUK. These are thick terminology. Perhaps you hear DRS mentioned when you watch the sport on a Sunday afternoon. In the vehicles now, which is some of the most efficient internal combustion engines on the planet. There are also e-turbochargers. What comes next will be the rollout of the technology into luxury sports uh, vehicles. This, these are vehicles where the brand DNA matters greatly. First to market is the premier principle for these brands. And we're very close to that moment now. Following that, we'd like to uh, move into the realms of premium uh, vehicles. In the near future, Euro 7 will be upon us and will be prevented from running gasoline engines at anything other than stoichiometric. So we'll, hit, we'll hear this terminology, Lambda 1. And what the e-turbo gives you in such a vehicle, and I'll show you in the case studies, is great drivability and affordable compliance. Then, of course, we're a volume business. Our ultimate goal is to bring a technology like this to mainstream. 
Again, Lambda 1 will dominate as a prerequisite uh, for Euro 7. Fuel economy in this uh, vehicle segment is, uh, is extremely important. And of course, cost to value uh, ratio is the overriding factor. There's so many technologies bidding to become part of the next engineering package of such mainstream vehicles. Uh, the e-turbo has a lot of competition to uh, to overcome. So the first news I'd like to bring you today is that we're at stage two already. We're at step two at Luxury Sport. In September, you'll have seen press releases from Mercedes AMG and from Garrett Motion. This has announced a uh, launch of an e-turbo vehicle. As yet, the details remain uh, unnamed, but it announces the uh, release of an e-turbo powered vehicle in 2021. We won't dwell on that too much uh, today, but you can read about the press release um, at the link shown on the page. What we will spend our time talking about today is two case studies. The two cars you see there are in the Garrett fleet of uh, e-turbo vehicles. The first one that's been around for a couple of years now is uh, the Q7 on the right hand side. And the newest one is the A-Class Mercedes on the left hand side. Both of these projects have been run in collaboration with OEMs. And we've had an engineering partner, IAV of uh, Berlin, uh, who we've worked quite closely with over that period. Let's just take a look at what an e-turbocharger is. It's simply a regular turbocharger with an electric motor in uh interspersed into the bearing system it's connected to some power electronics either separate as shown here or integrated to the actual body of the turbocharger and it's connected here very simplistically to a battery but uh, you can think of that as the complete electrical network of the vehicle what an electrified turbocharger can do for you is basically broken down into four categories. It can enhance performance, it can enhance and enable advanced combustion. It can play a role in energy management strategy for the vehicle, and it can w provide special functions at special moments in time in the off design conditions that all vehicles have to uh, perform to anyway. Downspeeding and downsizing are two terms that we use all the time. Uh, it can make a 1.5 liter engine feel like a two liter or a two liter feel like a three liter. We're going to show you how we've enabled Lambda One, which is a future requirement. We're going to show how we can enable millerization, which is a fuel economy requirement. And we have projects in the pipeline where we enable lean combustion, which runs at up to Lambda 1.7, where this is really the ultimate for brake thermal efficiency of a future engine. And we might be pushing uh, into the high 40% uh, in, at this time. So typically 47, 48%. Energy management strategies. At any one point in time, we might want to be charging the battery in order to deal with an instantaneous state of charge issue, or we might be wanting to keep our powder dry and wait and view the e-horizon of the vehicle to know the topology of the road in front of us and to know whether we're coming to a city or into a highway section. And we might want to take different decisions on energy management, depending on where the vehicle is in the, on the road and where it's going. We can recuperate and we can turbo compound with an e-turbo. Uh, e in the start phases, we can do thermal management. We can also do secondary air injection. And we'll touch on that later on in the pre 
presentation. We can, when we don't have any turbine power, we can still boost the engine if that's what's required, and we can act as a supercharger uh, for some of the time. So these are many of the things that we can do with an e-turbocharger, and you'll notice uh, we're focusing today on gasoline. I will touch on diesel at the end of the presentation, and I'll touch also on commercial vehicle. So let's go into the demonstration and case study of a two liter gasoline engine, a modern engine in a large SUV vehicle. This vehicle is 2.2 tons net and around 2.5 tons gross. What we did with IAV Berlin with Audi's help was we took a production vehicle sold with a peak torque of 380 newton meters it's here on the black line and we raised the performance of that uh, engine to the red line so we kept almost the same low end torque we increased the steady state torque to around 420 newton meters and then on the power curve we increase from 185 kilowatts to 215 kilowatts and we did that while going from the black line here on the lambda trace which is lambda not equal to one so we were running fuel enrichment here in order to manage temperatures and they were running scavenging here in order to provide the low end torque at the top all the time we were maintaining exhaust temperatures of 980 degrees and what you see is we were able to do this while just using up to three kilowatts of electrical support in the steady state at the low end and no electricity was required in order to uh, support the 420 newton meter uh, plateau so that was the steady state performance of the vehicle. The transient performance of the vehicle uh, is best demonstrated in load steps. What you see is three load steps at 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 RPM. We'll focus on the 1,500 one. The vehicle with the series engine in it has a relatively slow pickup when you go through that load step with the e-turbo uh, response is spontaneous and we reach uh, the target uh, torque within a second boost pressure follows the torque trace turbocharger speed mimics the two of them and you see up to six kilowatts of electrical power being used to boost the turbine in the first second second and a half and then in order to maintain the plateau, we maintain the machine at around two kilowatts of input. Just looking either side, 1000 and 2000, these transients take place uh, uh, in the case of 1000, a little bit slower, but we don't need as much boost in, or electrical boost in order to uh, get to the set point because the set point's only at 200 Newton meters. At 2,000 RPM, the, the engine, the base engine is more responsive any anyway. So in order to fill in that gap, we only need to go up to six kilowatts momentarily, and then we can drop back down to zero. So you can see that both the steady state and the transient performance of the vehicle were significantly improved. On a test track, uh, let's... Um, Let's translate that into what it would look like for you. A baseline vehicle running at 60 kilometers per hour, if you, and the e-turbo vehicle running at the same speed, if they both kick down simultaneously. By the time the e-turbo vehicle reached 100 kilometers per hour, it would be three and a half car lengths in front of the baseline. 
it's not all about going faster. It's about really sovereignty of uh, a vehicle like this and how easy it is to drive and how correct it feels to drive. What we can tell you is while we were on that particular test uh, track, we were able to drive 7% and 21% uh, gradients, and we were able to pull up those gradients in sixth gear with the electric turbo turned on and only fourth gear uh, with it turned off. This gives you an idea of the gearbox calibration or the, the scope we have to rethink gearbox calibrations when we install an electric turbo. In the case of the 21% hill, so here we're really talking about alpine roads. We're able to climb in fifth gear instead of third gear. And this is from the extra torque that the engine is producing and producing instantaneously. Another char characteristic which is important in this segment is uh, torque consistency. We spoke on the engine dyno of uh, how you see uh, a load step at 1500. Well, now when we transfer that into a vehicle and we do successive tip ins from two to and a half thousand, from 2750, from 3000, etc., you see that the engine and the vehicle velocity, they simply keep rising. And what you get is a very harmonious uh, behavior of the vehicle, which has which gives you this impression, which the harder you drive it, the more consistent it is. But we've not limited ourselves to test benches and test tracks. These vehicles are homologated to run on the open road. You see them here, or you see one of them here in uh, close to where I live and work in the Vosges mountains of France. This year has been extraordinary in many ways. Um, one of the things is the extraordinarily blue skies uh, that we have. There's no vapor trails and there's uh, very little uh, uh, pollution around. So it's made for some great photographs. But behind all of this is some very serious engineering work. And there's a first hint here. Um, many of you are logged in from the UK today where a thousand meters or 3000 feet sounds like a high mountain in either Wales or Scotland. This car park is at 1,000 meters, and it's approximately 20 minutes drive from where I am. And these are real roads which people drive on all the time. They're not mountain roads. And if you buy a vehicle like this uh, on the continent of Europe or in Scotland or in Wales, you really expect it to drive uh, correctly anywhere you can. Here we've taken a... Uh, acceleration and this is simply a photograph of a monitor which is in the vehicle uh, while we were driving up locally up a road of around 7% gradient. We did three consecutive accelerations, one with the e-turbo on, one with it off and one with it on again. On the, you see here the power that we were putting into the unit. So we went to six kilowatts, here we've got nothing, here we've got six kilowatts again. Directly above it, you see the boost trace. Just to the left, you see the turbocharger speed trace. And I can assure you that these accelerations feel very different. What you get in with the turbocharger enabled is an immediate rise in boost pressure and you see the immediate response of the turbocharger. With the e-turbo turned off electrically, what you get is a very slow risk increase in speed and a very slow and even concave uh, response of the boost pressure. This translates into the driver has pressed the pedal 
and yet nothing has happened in the vehicle and the vehicle's not accelerating. You turn the e-turbo back on again and suddenly everything is right with the world and the car is responsive and uh, driving properly once again. Some of you might be interested in zero to 100 and how that feels in the vehicle. Well, how it feels is a lot faster. And particularly what happens is you spend a lot less time in first gear. So you get very quickly through first gear, you get into second, third and fourth, and you reach your 100 kilometers per hour in something like 8.4 seconds instead of 10. You do all that and the engine is quiet and the passengers are calm and relaxed through the acceleration. Another thing we were able to do with, since we had the, the vehicles was we were able to gather duty cycles. This is just an example of uh, some activations of the electric turbo during a drive around a local city. So here we're driving around, the turbo is uh, activating from time to time and on the y-axis you see the uh, duration of each of the activations. So some of the activations are up to two and a half seconds, some are as short as half a second. And generally there's not that many. You get out onto the open road, into the country and onto hill routes, and this chart becomes, firstly, uh, we have to rescale it. Uh, so we've now got activations up to six seconds. There's many, many more activations, and there's more activations at higher power. So the, these demonstrators have allowed us to learn how we need to size components for durability and uh, how we need to in, uh, design the interface between the electric turbo and the vehicle electric network. Next, we come to a principle of recuperation. Now, there's several types of recuperation. Uh, recuperation, first of all, let's do the simple one, kinetic. We accelerate the turbocharger. The turbocharger rotor has uh, some inertia. And we're going to tip out at some point and we want to slow the turbocharger down. Well, we can use the electric motor to break uh, the turbocharger. And you see here, driving around the city, in this case, city of Berlin, uh, we were making some activations on the orange curve and we are making some braking events at which are the green curve and this was take this data was taken some 18 months ago and even at this stage we were recovering 60 percent of all the energy that we were putting in what we've uh, since been able to do is also engineer recuperate thermal recuperation or waste heat recovery recuperation so here you see a chart of the uh, wltc test cycle these are the points uh, in the orange circles of the wltc test cycle for the q7 the kite shaped chart is actually the recuperation chart of the turbocharger in this configuration and you can see it it ranges from zero down here in the red to four and a half kilowatts up here at rated power. It's a complicated chart, uh, so I'll outline uh, the WLTC. Basically, the WLTC points fall within the blue uh, box. You then get a 100 watt line uh, where you can ISO uh, line where you can recover 100 watts all the time, and you get a one kilowatt, and we've overlaid a one kilowatt uh, line as well. Out of cycle, so on the open road, when you're on the highway, when you're in Germany, traveling at speed, uh, you can recover all the way up to 4.8 kilowatts in this particular aerodynamic match. 
We have the ability to move this kite shape left and right, depending on the match of the turbocharger. And in this particular case, we were heading for 110 kilowatts per litre, so 215 kilowatts in total. So basically, this kite shape is, is shifted quite a long way to the right. But it, it, we could equally move it to the left if we wanted. In a WLTC test now, uh, we've actually measured a full cycle. We've measured the motoring events here on the, above the zero. We've measured the recuperation events uh, below the zero. And what you see is we were uh, motoring up to six kilowatts. We were recuperating up to two kilowatts. Uh, in this portion of the cycle, due to the prototype electronics, we were slightly we were a slight consumer. But in this part of the cycle, so the extra urban and the highway cycle, we were a net provider uh, to the electric system. And we averages out are in this particular match at around 25 watt hours, which equates to 1% in the WLTC cycle, probably 2% in the uh, real world. And if we had have matched with a smaller wastegate or with a VNT, uh, it would have been a good deal more than this as well. So that information has been public for some time now, um, but we'll come now to the truly new um, part of the presentation. Um, one of the teams at Garrett has taken the same principle. Uh, we've downsized the turbocharger to a much smaller frame size. We've taken a smaller vehicle with a smaller engine. Now we're a 1.3 litre, or 1.33 actually. Uh, the vehicle and the engine come from Daimler. Uh, you can read some of the uh, technical details here. Um, we're now, uh, the base turbocharger here comes from us, it's a GT12. Uh, the e-turbo we're naming somewhat non-dimensionally as the medium e-turbo. E and uh, what we're able to see is we matched with an eGT15. So we went up in size of uh, turbocharger, again, to so that we can match for that Lambda 1 uh, condition. Uh, we put on the into the vehicle, uh, we put an electrical network. It's not a full mild hybrid vehicle, um, but we have a 48 volt source, uh, we have an inverter, and we run a micro network in the in the trunk of the car so that we can reuse the electricity uh, that we produce when we're generating and we can, we have a source of uh we have a battery for uh uh to actually power the e-turbocharger so a little bit about the matching we were able to match a compressor um which fitted well with the torque characteristics that we wanted to produce so uh, we we took a larger turbine uh, which was coincidentally much more efficient as well and we increased the permeability of the whole setup by about 40% so that we could get to that Lambda 1 uh, condition. Um, what did that do for us in terms of uh, pressures? Well, many of you will recognize the full load uh, BME P curve. We dropped uh, P3 or the inlet pressure to the turbine by approximately one bar by going from a GT12 to a GT15. That allowed us to run the Lambda 1. It also reduced uh, the residual gases in the cylinder at the end, or by dropping the P3, we reduced the residual gases in the cylinder. Uh, at the end of each firing stroke, we were able to, uh, this has a very beneficial effect on knock resistance. And we were able to advance the spark by about three degrees, which brought us back into more efficient combustion and uh, better CA50s. Looking now at the turbocharger, 
and what's inside. For obvious reasons, uh, some of this is non-dimensionalized. Um, but uh, like many electric motors, we have uh, a basic torque curve, which has a torque plateau, and then a constant power section as we go up in motor speed. If we look at it on a power basis, we start at zero power, we, we rise to a, a knee point, and then we go at constant power. So we have several degrees of freedom with how we design the, the motor and uh, what, we, uh, what we're actually looking for in each of these applications. So as you can imagine, We've, so we've tested and we've selected uh, various options, both in simulation and in hardware, as we've been through the program. We've selected the characteristics that we're happy with, and we've moved on to uh, vehicle simulation, or engine simulation, should I say. Of course, you can always keep going up and up and up in torque uh, and power, but there is a uh, law of diminishing returns and some of our simulations show us this that basically these are um, load step simulations from uh, gt power with a the baseline turbocharger response is slow as you increase the electrification and going in this direction response of course uh gets faster and faster but you'll notice if we pull out the gradient of these lines and the time at which you reach 90 percent of the torque you can make a plot like this which actually shows you that uh you can start here and you can move up this line and you reach a point where you start asking yourself does the motor need to be any larger and more powerful in order to do what I want it to do? Because now, I, even though I increase the size again, really I'm starting not to make too much in, impact on time to talk or indeed what the driver feels, which is more the slope of this line. So we've taken our decisions around that. We've spoken to our partners, and I think we've come to some good uh, uh, compromises on when an electric motor is big enough. So we put that into prototypes. We're now on the test bench. And uh, here you see, similar to the Q7, we've enhanced the torque curve of this 1.3 liter engine. Uh, we've enhanced the power curve. We've used a little bit of electrical power at the low end in order to uh, uh, support the low end torque. And we've made a huge difference in going from lambda 0.85 to lambda 1 in the specific fuel consumption here. And uh, we're something like 20% uh, lower in fuel consumption along the full load line. Of course, that's not the same as being 20% lower in a in a cycle, but uh, we've re really made a big difference along the full load line of the vehicle. And now this this system can run Lambda 1 into the catalyst and it can think of being emission compliant for Euro 7. So similar to the Q7, uh, we show excellent uh, acceleration characteristics and in, in load steps on uh, test benches. We're using this time up to uh, 2.8 kilowatts in the acceleration phase. Uh, the 2000 RPM peaks at 2.8. It holds a little for a little while and then it drops down to a little over a kilowatt. We transfer into really visible and uh, uh, differences that you can sense on the road as well. Um, the blue car, the one with the e-turbo, is, is really 60 meters ahead of the black car after 13 seconds in a fourth gear acceleration. In a sixth gear acceleration, it's even more noticeable. It's 163 meters ahead after 30 seconds. 
of course, the world is um, is not all about performance. It's about um, fuel fuel economy, and uh, one of the things which is really looked into very seriously with this program is how do we demonstrate that a technology like e turbo can be beneficial in uh, for fuel economy and co2 in the future so we look at particularly at rde cycles um, because conformity of production uh, fuel consumption uh, in use fuel consumption is going to be a big subject uh, in the future and this is typically how an RDE cycle might be made up, an uh, urban portion, extra urban and highway. Um, this, these are the points on the BMEP map that you would be using in the, C, uh, in the A class vehicle. And in the, the contours are actually the lambda contours overlaid. What we've demonstrated with this early uh, prototype is that we recover all of the energy that we use to boost. We recover it in later phases of the cycle. Basically, the E-Turbo here is fuel, fuel consumption neutral. And you get, uh, in this particular setup, you get exceptional driving characteristics. Now, we can trade that. And in the in the future, um, we think we will be trading it um, for uh, making aerodynamics, which are much more suited to pure fuel economy. As a next step, uh, this demonstrator will take new aerodynamics. Uh, we'll trade some of the transient performance that we've had to date and we will improve the fuel economy of the vehicle by between three and four percent whether we're talking about wltc or rde conditions one of the other important uh, considerations for the future is uh, cold start i don't mean to super cold start i mean regular cold starts you first drive away in the morning because it's going to be in the regulation cycle um today in the usa and sometimes in europe uh, we use things called secondary air pumps um, which allow the catalyst to get some extra oxygen and it allows uh the catalyst to uh deal with uh, uh get some more warmth into it more quickly and to uh, get some uh, get in improved conversion of CO and hydrocarbons. In the future, in an RDE drive away, there's going to be much more of the engine map used. And uh, today in a WLTC, um, a secondary air pump perhaps consumes up to half a kilowatt or so of electricity. These devices are typically small and relatively low cost uh, devices, but in the RDE world that we're moving into and uh, where you have where you could fail an emissions test in the first 60 seconds of a cycle. We calculate that the operating points you would need to run at would be equivalent to one kilowatt and even in close to the end of that first 60 seconds. Uh, up to two kilowatts of power would be required totally out of the question for a secondary air pump of uh, the current design but an e-turbo can cover it in flow range and uh, power and we think that this will become an important secondary function of the e turbocharger so we're coming to the end of the presentation and i'd like to uh, conclude uh, by saying that uh, what we've done at Garrett over the last couple of years, in addition to uh, developing the actual technology of e-turbochargers, is we've built uh, two demonstrator vehicles, one SUV and one C-segment vehicle. Uh, the SUV was targeted at 110 kilowatts uh, per liter, 200 newton meters per liter, and had exceptional transient characteristics at 80 newton meters per liter second and it was all done in Lambda 1. The C-segment vehicle 
uh, was a slightly different match. We targeted essentially 100 kilowatts per litre, a little bit more in terms of torque. And we were able to produce almost double the transient impact. Both of these uh, sizes have been able to demonstrate drivability and comfort. And it's been inherent that we've upsized and made the turbo machinery more efficient while we've been doing it. We've, uh, we've seen fuel economy reductions because of the larger uh, turbo machinery. And most importantly, we've been able to reach that Lambda 1 condition, which is so important for the future. GT15, we, we took that onto the rolling roads and we showed that uh, we didn't impact uh, fuel consumption uh, in a negative way. We can now go forward with new aerodynamics and we can look at actually improving the fuel economy. We've also, in these two demonstrators, really only touched the uh, turbine type of uh, wastegate. We have several demonstration programs now running with variable geometry turbines attached to the turbos, and it increases the amount of electrical recuperation you can do quite significantly. And it's also part of the trend uh, for future gasoline engines. We finally we've uh, learned about the duty cycles, and we've explored some of the future functionalities, two of which I talked about in the presentation, but the last one I'd mention is uh, actually we become a protection device for the catalyst of the future. When you go to Lambda 1, exhaust temperatures go up and we get concerned about catalyst durability. The e-turbocharger can act as a generator, it can act as a sink for the excess enthalpy which is in the exhaust and it can help maintain acceptable t4 temperatures into the catalyst for longer um, this is all to do with the motor generator sizing probably that we would have to size larger than we've shown in these two demonstrators to get a significant effect but we have demonstrators running now, which is showing 25, 30, 40 degrees uh, reduction in uh, catalyst inlet temperature at rated power, which is getting into the territory where you don't, don't require to think of other solutions such as water injection. What we have now at Garrett, and I'll leave you with these thoughts, is uh, we have a, a medium sized uh, e-turbocharger which is suitable for small gasoline engines and two litre diesels. We have a large turbocharger uh, and this is the family uh, which the Mercedes AMG launch will come from uh, next year and that's typically used on two litre gasoline, three litre diesels in the passenger car domain and three to six litre diesels in the commercial vehicle domain. And then we have an extra large uh, motor and generator arrangement, which is used for, let's call them special engines or large engines in the gasoline family. Probably we don't find any diesel engine in passenger car in this range anymore, but we do find many of our medium duty and heavy duty on-road uh, commercial vehicles and indeed even tractors and off-highway machines of all descriptions. Um, we're actually involved in a European program called Long Run where we're applying uh, e-turbochargers in this kind of size category. So with that, I think I've reached the end of my time. Um, of course, Garrett is a changing uh, company at the moment. Um, you see me with a mask today. These pictures were taken pre-COVID. Uh, um, but we have a lot of fresh faces in the company with uh, a lot of new uh, capabilities and competencies that go into designing e-turbochargers and even this machine, which is an e-compressor for a fuel cell, 
Um, it's really a dynamic and exciting time uh, to be part of the turbocharger and turbo machinery uh, group in uh, in Garrett. And I'm sure you're going to hear a lot more of the company in the very near future. Um, I will do a few manipulations here to get back onto uh, video, and then we're going to have uh, the question and answer session. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. So Peter, thank you very much for the for the presentation. Uh, I'm Manuel Corsetti, marketing director at uh, at Garrett, working with uh, with Peter. I'm going to help you moderate a little bit the the questions. And I think if you go back to your slide uh, 42, I think we have a nice transition with questions about uh, use cases and the value in the use for uh, diesel application, maybe, or in uh, uh, commercial vehicle applications. Okay. So I'm not entirely sure um, which screen you're seeing at the moment, Manu, but uh, maybe, maybe there we go to uh, slide 42. Are you seeing the right screen? We, we, we see two screens now. You see two screens? Okay, let's just swap them over and there we go. That should be right. Exactly. Okay, so fire away. Maybe you want to repeat the question, please. So basically, we have some questions asking about, you know, uh, what could be the value of e turbo in either a diesel application or in a commercial vehicle application? Okay, so I think in, in diesel, or oh, diesel's issue is primarily uh, NOx. Diesel's been in the news um, since 2015 for all the wrong reasons. Um, one of the biggest uh, tools we have uh, in diesel engines to reduce NOx emissions is actually to run EGR through transients. When you run EGR through transients, you also have to run uh, boost pressure because the engine still needs uh, fresh air uh, to combust the fuel you're going to burn. So one of the things I foresee in passenger car diesels uh, especially is that uh, people will use an e-turbo in order to uh, boost the engine and provide oxygen for the combustion while maybe the turbine is being starved of exhaust uh, enthalpy uh, because we're running high pressure EGR or because we're running low pressure EGR and we simply need more compression power in order to get the required amount of EGR into the turbo. We also have to think of the filling and emptying times of uh, the air path. Um, we have to perhaps clear between two and five liters of uh, exhaust uh, or EGR filled uh, intake air each time we want to uh, do a tip in or a uh, load step. So very important that uh, the turbocharger has a good response time. Very important that uh, with a second source of energy on the turbine, uh, you can think of running different EGR strategies. Then on a um, commercial vehicle, uh, the applications are, are multiple. We can do thermal management. Uh, we can play tunes with uh, position of the wastegate, pos position of the VNT, and the intensity with which we en energize the uh, e-motor. Um, basically, we're, we're controlling uh, the airflow and uh, the EGR flow separately. We use the turbine to set the EGR flow. We, we use the uh, uh, e-motor to set the turbocharger speed and the boost pressure. And it really simplifies the task ahead of the uh, commercial vehicle engineer. We can also think of uh, waste heat recovery. Um, really depends on what the client is looking for from a particular application. Okay, thank you, Peter. So here again on the presentation, you focused on uh, 48 volt applications. We have many questions about, you know, what could be the, the different value in either mild hybrid, full hybrid or plug-in hybrid applications. Right, okay. So I, th I think we are, to some extent, uh, voltage agnostic. Uh, Manu's 
quite correct. We we focused on two applications, which are 48 volt um, in the demonstration cars. Uh, but indeed, one of our first uh, programmed launches uh, will be at a much higher voltage uh, than, than that. So basically, the power there's nothing um, linking us only to or tying us to 48 volt. We can go to 280, we can go to 400, we could go to 700 if we wanted. So we would um, propose to uh, tailor the power electronics to the voltage of the vehicle. And then, of course, the support uh, that we can give to a particular vehicle uh, is, is very dif different. A mild hybrid is perhaps the one which is most challenged uh, for performance. So I would imagine that uh, we would match aerodynamically uh, in favor of uh, best possible engine performance from the mild hybrid. Uh, in the case of uh, high voltage hybrids, um, there's more electric motor, there's more torque, there's more electric torque available in these vehicles. So uh, pure performance is less of the issue, but uh, energy management becomes much more of uh, uh, the target. And there, I think we would particularly look at uh, bespoke aerodynamics in order to shift our focus from pure performance to uh, uh, exceptional fuel economy. Okay, thank you, Peter. So other questions uh, coming about how would you position the value and uh, maybe different uh, use cases of e-turbo versus e-compressor or electric uh, compressor? So again, both of the uh, technologies are valid. Um, there's more functionality with the uh, e-turbo than with an electric compressor. But in the case where an electric compressor is good enough, then it's a perfectly uh, valid uh, solution. Um, we tend to think that our customers want to make efficient designs and ultimately low cost designs and with customized e turbochargers we think you get to the best possible package solution with equivalent or higher functionality at a cost which is comparable to buying uh, two separate machines an e-compressor and a turbocharger Okay, one uh, now one very technical question about in the case of uh, electric gasoline, but could could be maybe on a diesel application as well. How could uh, e turbo would be used as a as a fresh air uh, function basically? As a, as a secondary air pump. Uh, yeah. Well, there are in a secondary air system today. Uh, you have. Uh, a separate pump and you have an air path which uh, puts air into directly into the exhaust system just before the catalyst essentially the catalyst is or the engine is running uh, rich and uh, the extra air that you pump into the exhaust system uh, brings it back to uh, stoichiometric you can remove that pump, you can install uh, the e-turbocharger and you can install a bypass around the, the engine. Uh, generally, this would be a channel through the engine block, through the cylinder head. It would be controlled uh, at one end or the other uh, by a, a valve. And basically, we would bleed off some of the boost air, which is going to the engine directly into the uh, exhaust. This would essentially provide the same function then as the secondary air, but it, you'd have a lot more capacity of air available than a classical secondary air pump. And therefore, you'd be able to meet the uh, operating points that will be challenged to meet uh, more accurately uh, and more efficiently than with a regular secondary air device. 
Thank you, Peter. Now another question about uh, what could be the, the value of a knee turbo in case of a lean burn uh, gasoline application? So, uh, lean burn applications um, are exceedingly efficient, which by implication means there's very little exhaust enthalpy available, which means uh, for, for a turbocharger engineer, somebody is stealing the energy that's used to drive the turbines. So, we can either go to a situation where we have uh, extraordinarily high efficiency turbo machines, but at some point there is a, an asymptote. And as you go more and more efficient, you tend to go larger and you tend to go to higher and higher inertia. So the turbo machine becomes a slower and a more sluggish uh, device as you do so. We also have this issue of um, Lean burn tends to run with a lot of EGR as well to get to best possible efficiency. And we have a mixture in the air path, which sometimes we want to evacuate um, in order to make tip-ins and in order to get uh, responsiveness out of the engine. So really in the lean burn situation, the E-Turbo the e is there to uh, as a scavenging pump in order so that you can change your lambda and change the operating conditions as quickly as possible. So I hope I answered the question. Uh, we actually, it's not 100% public yet, um, but uh, the partner we're working with has actually shown uh, the vehicle on one or two occasions. Um, but there'll be another SUV vehicle available uh, within the next, uh, well, let's say within 2021 for demonstration. Um, and there we have lean burn, one point, Lambda 1.7 with an E-Turbo uh, used to compensate for the uh, significant loss in transient in the engine uh, that they've suffered. And uh, the whole package uh, should have a brake thermal efficiency of around 47%. If we go back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of the presentation, we were talking about uh, uh, Formula One. Um, some of you already know this, but some of you might be surprised to know that Formula One is lean burn. Uh, Formula One has a brake thermal efficiency in the order of 50. Of course, they spend a lot more money per engine than most people are willing to spend. But uh, when, when you talk about uh, a road car with a uh, with Lambda 1.7 and uh, uh, brake thermal efficiency of 47%, uh, then we get into pretty high tech and some pretty good engineering numbers. Okay, Peter, thank you. And maybe now, uh, la last question around the packaging in general. So we have some questions about, you know, uh, could we equally integrate uh, an e-turbo uh, architecture with uh, fixed geometry or variable geometry? And after all the questions about basically packaging constraints uh, on their bonnet uh, for the OEM. Yeah. So the, the answer is absolutely. If, um, if for various reasons uh, a client um, prefers a, waste, uh, a fixed geometry or waste-gated turbocharger, I'm sure uh, that is possible. If they prefer variable geometry, um, we'd be delighted to place a variable geometry turbine onto an e-turbo. It changes the duty. It changes what you can do with the device. Um, but uh, obviously, as you upgrade the turbine, you get to do more with the aerodynamic machine and you can focus the electrical machine on uh, on different areas and you, it gives you more aerodynamic uh, freedom. Um, I think you also men mentioned something else there, Manu. Uh, a, Basically, uh, packaging, uh, no, packaging know, yeah. challenges under the bonnet of, 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 yeah. of a vehicle. So 
what what I can say is um, so far we've not been defeated. Um, we've been able to package every application we've looked at. Uh, we've uh, we've looked at some uh, large ones, uh, and we're currently looking at some pretty small ones. So in the one point X category, and here in the uh, C segment vehicle, the Mercedes A class, I can assure you there's not a lot of underbonnet space uh, available, but uh, it has a, uh, a right size D turbo in there, as does the Q7. So uh, we we don't see really uh, with the with the right diligence, uh, we don't see any uh, barriers to uh, uh, being able to package G turbos right now. Yes, and to be complete, let's not forget that in case of diesel, E turbo could be a replacement for a two stage. So in which case you would replace a two turbo. Indeed. By, Indeed. Uh, by one. So thank you uh, very much, Peter. I think now the, the time uh, is gone. We were one o'clock in, in the UK, uh, uh, two o'clock in uh, continental Europe. So if I can just direct uh, anybody who would like to learn more, uh, we have a mixture of uh, registra people registered for the webinar. Uh, government officials, OEMs, tier ones, suppliers, universities, the list is long. Um, please, I would direct you to the link on the bottom of this uh, page. We'll leave it up for a few moments. Um, please write it down. Come to the Garrett website. We are available to answer your questions. Um, obviously, if we get into too deep details, uh, we'd be delighted to answer them to OEMs. Um, for for some folk, uh, please, uh, sometimes the answer is going to be, well, you may just have to wait and see. Um, but uh, we, in general, we want to promote this technology. Uh, we want to uh, help bring it to market. Uh, we think it's very exciting times uh, for all of the turbocharger manufacturers, uh, Garrett in particular. It gives us a great opportunity to bring electrified machinery into uh, into the automotive world. And, uh, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, our partners. I'd like to thank the collaborators that we've had within the company. Uh, many teams of people have worked on this all over the world. I salute you. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the attendees of the webinar uh, for giving me an hour of your time uh, today. And uh, I hope we speak in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter.